Okay, can everyone see that? I can't see you guys now, so someone will have to say yes. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, I am taking this opportunity, um, unexpected opportunity today, to share with you the research from our latest paper that we mentioned in the meeting um, yesterday. I'm sorry, I'm just managing the people coming in at the same time, so I might be a bit, let's admit everybody. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so we uh, just got this accept accepted in the Science of the Total Environment. It's just in, um, in press at the moment. So really excited to share the link with you guys soon. But I thought we'd tell you a little bit of a story about um, how this research came about and um, yeah, how we started the journey really to this program that we're all a part of now. Um, fab. So. I don't really need to spend too long convincing you guys why the marine biodiversity of Galapagos is so important. Um, we all know this area is very well known for um, hosting a lot of um, endangered species that are endemic to the marine reserve found nowhere else. And we are really interested to fill in some of the knowledge gaps of how plastics as a novel pollutant to this system are um, affecting the, the ecosystems and wildlife that live within them. So my PhD um, was focusing mostly on trying to get an environmental baseline, particularly of microplastics among different marine habitats. And I was looking particularly at impacts at the bottom of the food web. So interactions with marine algae and with marine invertebrates, none of which are on this slide, I might now <laughs> say. Um, I've been working really closely with JP at the Galapagos Science Center and University of Sunshine Coast, who is looking at the impacts of plastics on vertebrates. So together we should be building this really comprehensive picture of how plastics are um, accumulating in different habitats in the marine reserve and how they might be impacting different types of species. Whoops, so here we go. This was the, the dream team as we arrived to San Cristobal. This was back in May 2018 when we did our first sampling and that's the data that this paper is based on. So you can see Kerry and Adam here from Exeter and we're outside the Galapagos Science Center with our excellent GSC t-shirts Many thanks to JP and Danny who sorted those out for us, ready to go on our first field trip. So our main objectives are kind of in three areas. One was to establish an island scale plastic pollution baseline. So as I mentioned, trying to look at different habitats in the marine environment to understand how plastics are partitioning out within the environment. Um, we then wanted to screen marine invertebrates across different feeding modes. So we have filter feeders, such as barnacles and oysters that feed on particles in the water column. We look at um, grazing marine invertebrates like snails and urchins that kind of scrape surfaces um, to, to collect their food. And then also um, the deposit food in sea cucumbers. So we're looking at a variety of different species um, to understand how microplastics are being taken up in them. And then the final area was looking at um, trying to develop a rapid assessment approach to score vertebrates for potential risks to plastics. So um, I'll explain a bit more about the process we used for that, especially because I was really excited that um, Pro Delphinus team as part of the PPSS network are uh, developing this scoring approach even further and applying it to the whole regional um, uh, marine vertebrate landscape <laughs> in Peru. Um, great, so here is our, our first study island is San Cristobal. You can see that's in the southeast of the, of the archipelago. And you can also see that um, it has a high influence from the Humboldt current. So that exposed um, easterly facing coastline um, is pretty much the first landmass that that Humboldt current um, reaches as it veers out towards the equator. 
And the reason why we're so interested in San Cristobal is because um, this exposed coastline anecdotally was one of the, the biggest plastic accumulation sites we knew about in the archipelago, also from the work that Conservation International and the National Park have done cleaning up. We always know that this coastline is a particularly bad accumulation area. Um, it's a populated island, so we knew there could be um, a chance of local inputs, particularly of microplastics. And also it's really important for tourism and conservation. So as a case study island, um, it's ideal. It's also the situation of the Galapagos Science Center. So to do the lab work, it was really convenient as well. So you can see we sampled these 17 sites around the coastline, um, varying between tourism sites and remote sites that aren't visited as well. So we measured plastics in habitats um, yeah, around all of these sites. Here you can see the results for the beach plastics. Um, so this is macroplastic, which are whole items, and then fragments larger than five millimeters in the top graph. And then the bottom graph is sieved large microplastics that we collected in quadrats at the strand line of the beach, um, down to five centimeters depth. So what you can see here is that the um, sites are laid out in numerical order. You can see in this tiny map here where they correspond to around the coast. We kind of color coded that. So these ones are the orange ones are the north and west sites here, green around the south, and then blue are the easterly sites where you can see we get a lot more plastic accumulating here. Um, we then, as well as looking at abundance, we're looking at composition. And here you can see this story becoming even clearer that not only are we getting most of the plastic accumulating on this exposed coastline, the polymers are all very low density floating items. And so this is adding to our narrative that the majority of the large plastics we're finding are likely to be floating into the marine reserve from external sources. So you can see, you know, that's it's well over 90%. Um, of the plastics we're finding in polyethylene and polypropylene items. Sorry, this is like the world's busiest slide, but I didn't really uh, have too much notice to prepare, but I wanted to show you these, these beach data that I just showed you uh, versus the other habitats. So this third one is also beach sand, but this isn't sieved. So this includes smaller particles as well. We can see the same general pattern that there's more in these eastern sites, but the smaller the particles are, the more uniformly they tend to be distributed in this data. This one here is the seawater surface, um, which tells a, an interesting story itself as well. So overall, concentrations are relatively similar in the sea around the islands, apart from at this one site, where it's significantly higher. And this is the harbour. So this is the populated area. Um, this corresponds with perhaps more input from wastewater. So when there's laundry inputs, things like that, a lot of fibres from clothing um, get released into the environment. So that's possible sources. Also, there's more boat traffic in the harbour area. So some of these particles link with having more ropes and things like that in the water. This final one here is in benthic sediment and we didn't see any strong patterns with microplastics in benthic sediments. Um, if anybody's interested to learn more, I could go into a lot, lot, lot of detail about these different types of polymers we found, uh, what we think that means in terms of different sources of microplastics. You can see down this side is the ranges we find, which are, are very large ranges. Um, uh, yeah, so if anybody wants to chat more in detail, then definitely give me a shout of that. Looking at the composition of the larger items is helping us to, to try and answer the question of sources of plastics in Galapagos. So again, these are split between the northwest sites, the south sites and the east sites. Um, the ratios of assigned sources are relatively similar, interestingly, on all of the sites. It's the abundance that changes the most. Um, and what, what, we, what the headlines are here is that the majority of what we find are, is already fragmented um, or unable to be sourced. So 
in this unsourced items area, this could include all of the bottles we found, containers, things like that, because we weren't looking at brands. We were just trying to work out if these items had come from continental waste management sources or from the fishery maritime kind of sources. And things like domestic items, cosmetic bottles, uh, drinks bottles, it, we are currently unable to tell what proportion of them comes from fisheries, i.e. littered over the side of boats, versus what proportion comes, comes from the continent. And so I think that will be really interesting of how we can build on this work through the network, this network with the modeling that Ramsey and Eric are doing in the ocean and on land. Um, to see if we can try and get an idea of the fluxes between these, these sources. So again, if anybody's interested in finding out more, I can share with you the categorization we use for the items, uh, etc. So that's the first kind of environmental data snapshot. Now we're looking into the, um, the food web impacts. Um, as I said, we looked across seven species of marine invertebrates. Um, the numbers in percent in the pies are the percentage of individuals that we found microplastics in. Um, the, the N numbers underneath are the number of individual animals that we sampled. So you can see there's quite a big uh, range from only four chitons that we sampled versus 49 sea cucumbers. And so just a word of caution with this data that um, we haven't, yeah, some, some animals were more numerous and we were able to sample more of them. Um, we, I think it's also interesting for anybody working in this area for the lab side of things as the sizes of the particles we found were generally much higher than um, what we usually use in lab studies to try and work out harm from microplastics. So we recommend that perhaps larger particles are used more often in these lab studies to understand more about the impacts um, because that's what we're finding in, in the wild animals. Oops. Um, and then again, you can, we can make comparisons of the types of polymers, the types of particles that we find in the animals versus what we find in the sand, in the seawater, et cetera. And here the main story is that the grazers have got a much higher diversity of different plastics that they are exposed to. So these are things like snails that might um, graze on beach litter as well as um, perhaps being exposed to microplastics in water and sand as well. Whereas the filter feeders are only exposed to, to particles in the water and deposit feeders only exposed to particles in, in the sand. So. This is the, the other part of what we're trying to do to build up this ecological picture of how microplastics are, are moving around the environment. There's also interesting stories within the different organisms as well. So um, this on the left here is a, a, a clump of polypropylene fibers that unfortunately we find quite regularly, particularly in crustaceans. So this was found in a barnacle uh, in fact, it was the clumps like this were found in most of the barnacles. Um, and so in terms of risk to animals, um, this is something to consider because in many cases we think microplastics are often passed through animals. But if they start to clump like this, there's a greater risk of obstruction of gills or guts, depending on the animal as well. So we're really interested to see um, how, like where we find the microplastics in the animals as well. Um, on the second, this was something we didn't expect to find where we, we saw suspected bite marks on a lot of the plastic particles we found in urchins and snails, where you can see they were probably scraping um, larger pieces of plastic for the biofilms that, that um, accumulate on the surface. So with algae and small invertebrates, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was really interesting that we can pretty much see these urchin teeth marks in these particles that we um, <coughs> extracted from the animals. Um, yeah, so then the next stage was, obviously we can't um, sample all of the species in the Galapagos marine food web, and we wouldn't want to either, obviously, um, particularly for vertebrates. And so we decided to 
um, look into a risk scoring methodology. So this was developed in, in collaboration with Brendan and a master's student called Jess Vag, who did an amazing job of, of kickstarting this work. Um, what we did was got the species list from the jo Charles Darwin Foundation data zone. So they have an amazing resource with like all of the species that have ever been recorded in the marine reserve. Um, we gave each organism a score for their distribution. So endemic species were therefore prioritized, oh, definitely over invasive species, as you can imagine. The next score was around the conservation status of the animals. So we use the IUCN red list score as a proxy for this. Obviously that is not a faultless um, way to measure conservation status, but it's pretty much the best we have. And finally, we looked for evidence of harm to organisms from plastics, entanglement and ingestion in the literature. And because Although JP is doing some amazing work now to um, describe the encounters and interactions of vertebrates in Galapagos, at the time of this work, no, nothing was yet published. And so we looked for evidence of um, organisms of the same genus in other places that had been better studied. And this was the, the output that that analysis um, gave us. So we have like the species score distribution uh, for the species distribution, conservation status, the evidence we could find. And then we get we managed to get a list of 27 species in total that we think are, are uh, of higher risk. Um, not gonna go into that now. Again, if anybody's interested in learning more about the scoring, very happy to have a call about that later um, but yeah what this has managed to do is to give us a kind of uh, a tool to start to focus the next phase of research and to start focusing the mitigation and intervention projects that are a major part of this of this um, network of course we know that there's there will be more species that are, are likely to be affected than just these. And we need to do more research to understand how this harm is, is manifesting itself. But at least it gives us somewhere to start from that, you know, 3000 species that we had to start with. <laughs> so in conclusion from this work, we've managed to show that um, plastic litter is entering the marine reserve from a bunch of different sources, but that by far the majority appears to be from the continental and maritime sources external to the marine reserve. So only 2% of the items we, we thought were definitely attributable to local and tourism littering. So a very small amount that we could say for sure are coming from local sources. We can say that microplastic is certainly entering the marine food web um, at the concentrations we've, we have now in the marine reserve. Um, this is a concern of course because latest modeling studies have showed that plastics in the environment are likely to treble in the next 20 years so we know already at the concentrations we've got in Galapagos that or, you know this plastic is already entering the marine food web we do not yet know what impacts this has on either the vertebrates or human food web food chain even and We've showed that risk scoring presents a tool to highlight the most at risk species and starts to show some uh, of our major data gaps as well. Um, so thanks very much for listening to that um, summary of our recent work. 